welcome to the Horror Hangout, a podcast where film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time and talk about them. It is another one of our Fright Fest special interviews. Uh, my name is Andy Conduit Turner, and I am joined today by Stephen Pierce, the director of Heard. A well, we'll talk about Heard a little bit, but it's a film that is premiering worldwide, global premiere at Fright Fest mm-hmm. this year at time of recording. Just a few short days away. Stephen, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. No, thank you very much for having us and coming to talk to us just before you uh, deal with a transatlantic flight, right? That's that's right. You know, like nothing like, you know, before you go to see your film like somewhere, you have to like fly six or seven hours. That's always a great, that doesn't add any in sort of anticipation. Yeah, if you could just uh, try and be as jet lagged as possible for, uh, <laughs> exactly, for watching yeah. your film with an audience for the first time as well. I imagine you probably through the editing process, you've probably seen every film of the frame of the movie several times, right? But first time seeing an audience that you don't know personally reacting to it, right? Yeah, absolutely. We did some test screenings way back when we were in the edit, like, you know, with some audiences uh, in New York where we're based and uh, then did some revisions and some even some, you know, small reshoots and re-edits based on all of that. But most of those people were, you know, either friends of friends or colleagues or people somewhat attached to our world. So this is the first time, you know, seeing it with a big audience um you know obviously i've seen it many many times there was a week where we were doing color and mix you know in in the u.s and i was flying between atlanta and la finishing it and i watched it 12 times in one week and that was a lot of fun but uh yeah so i'm I've, it's been a little bit and i'm very 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 excited to see it you know at, at fright fest it's an awesome they've kind of sort of given us a great opportunity to show it too like you know we watch it saturday night on the imax and it's uh, going to be, I mean, I'm hope it seems like it's going to be a pretty full house, a lot of, a lot of eyes and ears. And so, you know, and, and it's always sort of terrifying for a filmmaker whenever you put something up on that big of a screen, because, you know, we see it a lot on a normal size screen and I've watched it on everything, but that you're going to blow up everything we did super big. So <laughs> just hoping it holds up. Oh, I can tell you as someone who had to go and get their tickets manually, ready to come and attend this, uh-huh. it's going to be full. Literally it was an exercise in real life horror getting on to book the the screen passes literally seeing the seats disappear in front of your eyes that were going to be available i think you're in for a fairly packed uh fairly packed event that will be so so awesome um i I really hope that's true it was we were really honestly very surprising and very lucky that uh, yeah it seemed like it sold pretty quick and they added a they actually added us a second screening on sunday i Um, saw that yeah i mean congrats obviously it goes goes to show the level of uptake that's going to be happen if they've added, added a second screening. I think a few, a couple of films, but by all means, not all have had to have extra screenings added. Yeah, it's a real, I mean, honestly, the Fright Fest has been, the whole team there has been amazing since they, you know, told us that they were, you know, willing to have us be a part of their thing. And it's, it's just continued to be an awesome experience. So as we're talking Fright Fest already, I want to go back in a little while and talk about your history as a filmmaker, but why, why Fright Fest for the, for the premiere is it logistics and that's you know the film was ready and this is the this is something that you know falls in the right time of year or is it something you wanted to go for an international premiere to start your your movie how did you make the decision that fright fest is going to be the one you were going for you know a little bit of column a a little bit of column b i think you know our film is coming out in the u.s it's ended up we've ended up having a really interesting sort of sales track where we're going to be set we've started selling internationally before we started selling in the u.s which is a little bit uncommon um but we ended up it's going to work out to where um it comes out in the u.s on october 13th in theaters and um i believe it's coming out that same weekend in the uk and potentially some other territories as well so really it was all about you know, trying to, we've been trying to, as much as we can, be patient and funnel all of our resources into a single sort of release, because to be an independent film, there's a limit on the marketing spend that we have that a lot of, that the studios don't. So for us, the the most successful pathway forward for the film potentially to be seen is to try and maximize, maximize the, the word of mouth. And if somebody sees it and they happen to like it and they share it, or we get an opportunity to talk to great podcasts like you guys, that we can say, hey, in the near future, here's where you go find it. So in the UK, we will be with High Flyers. We'll be out that week of October 13th if you don't get to see it at Fright Fest. Yeah, and um, speaking of which, I feel I should congratulate you. You mentioned there's an independent filmmaker 
um congratulations on having a horror film which has come out in the sensible time of year for horror films to come out october a lot of big studios have not managed to pull that off over the last couple of years particularly with international releases i know ben and i on the podcast have been bemoaning over the last 12 months there's been a lot of unusual release schedule choices and of course it's not the ones that not always the picks that everyone would make but as a horror fan for us it's it's fine. We, you know, I'd go and watch a horror film on Valentine's Day, but um, for general audiences and when you want to see films do well, I know that the certainly that in real life, the last voyage of the Demeter, which is the film that we were really looking forward to, they've had to move it from um, UK cinema releases as as planned, and it it's very deflating to see these things perhaps not reach their full potential because it's an unusual way to be released. So very very excited and pleased to see something which you know has a lot of great horror elements to it i would you know it's definitely a horror film but for those getting ready to watch it you'll get no spoilers from me everybody but it has a lot more dynamics and we'll we'll dive into the film itself shortly to look at some of those dynamics and things we'll be seeing going to see heard but before we do that Stephen, i mean you you know you started out as a as a filmmaker you could have chosen any genre or subgenre that you'd that you'd wanted to you could have been telling us historical period pieces if you'd wanted to you could have been doing musical comedies for all i know what what drove you into horror what what brought you to here as a and a, and a make you a horror filmmaker and a horror film fan well you make what you enjoy right you know like i i like genre films overall and uh, i've always they're sort of my that that that's a very wide spectrum. That's a wide net anymore, like what you call a genre film. But they're, they've always been sort of my favorites, the things that push reality sort of to their limits. Um, you know, and, that, and that's it's also the most fun sort of thing imaginatively to kind of get to, to break down. Ours is a zombie movie. That's sort of the backdrop is a zombie outbreak. Um, but we, we always kind of pitch it as like it's sort of in the world of The Last of Us because what horror does allow you to do is you know it gets you get to kind of you know bring in more fantastical general circumstances than perhaps other types of films and so this film hurt is really about examining people and how people interact with each other under pressure it's a sort of about you know dare i say herd thinking in many ways um so you that that's it was sort of a perfect match whenever we decided what we wanted to say with the film that this also be a horror film in that genre because the two the given circumstance allows us to do that without being preachy it allows us to put the really ratchet the tension up the stakes up for the characters put them in really difficult situations where they have to make you know challenging decisions um and you know throughout the film and that you know horror allows you to kind of do that in the most exciting way yeah agreed and then you mentioned having more nuance to it as well and i'm you have to tread especially carefully because I, 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 you know, I'll say it out loud, everybody. I, I've seen this movie. I recommend if you're at Fright Fest, check it out. If not, then wait for your opportunity to do so and do see it. I really thought some of the nuances that you brought in there with some of the character work, there is a bit, maybe when we're not recording, I'll talk to you about this as we wrap up at the end. There was, there are some certain bits where things drop into place and the character relationships and the dynamics and the points you're making really kind of click there it makes it makes for a very rewarding film and obviously you've mentioned those the relationships and the interactions between people um you know not one to draw parallels but if you look at some of the focus that i'd say some of the very best elements of things like the walking dead certainly in written format did that the focus not on you know the the zombie outbreak and the things are sometimes often a backdrop to the story you're telling right the interactions between the characters and the focus on those the you know the high stakes situations they're in feeds into what's going on with their relationships as well and i thought it was very nicely explored again i think we've we've skirted around and spoiling anything there but i think <laughs> it, it's very it was really an interesting watch not to just be hey you're not going to sit in and say hey this is people purely being torn apart for for 90 minutes there's a lot of personality there as well is that something you were very conscious of as you were because you co-wrote as well right 
Yeah, absolutely. My co-writer, James Allardyce, is also the, the, the lead producer on the film. We've worked together for a decade um, and he on, on everything from documentaries to commercials to short films to, you know, series that we've been showrunners on. And we talked a lot about the film and what we wanted from it, obviously, throughout writing it and then throughout producing it. And Gore wasn't one of our real goals. Um, you know, we think, I think he and I, I really enjoy a good Gore movie. You know what I mean? Whenever they come in, they're fun. Um, it's not the movie we wanted to make. For us, we constantly challenge ourselves to be like, why does this story need to be told? So we'll frequently write a screenplay or beat a screenplay out or outline it and get to something that's really fun and we think it's great. And then we just turn to each other and say like, yeah, but why does this need to be told? What is the point? What is the lasting power that you're trying to say? What are you adding to the world other than just minutes of entertainment? Um, and not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just the challenge we always present for ourselves. Um, and that, you know, is sort of what led us here to this exploration of character and that that whole that whole sort of thing. So, you know, we while writing it, we wanted to make sure that it really is, you know, it, it, you know, everybody says we try and make the characters really solid. That is obviously a goal for every screenplay and every writer. For us, um, we put them right at the core and right at the center of it. And we tried to create characters that have constant you know, needs that are not necessarily going to align with the people that they meet. The people they encounter might have a conflicting need or might have something else. And that for me makes it really the most complicated, most dynamic sort of storytelling because to get what I want from you as another character, I have to find a way to either convince you or force you or get away from you or something. But it, it's not an easy path. I don't just ask for what I want and get it. Um, so I think that that was part of the goal. Yeah. And um, yeah, very well realized. I'm looking forward to seeing it with the. Uh an audience but um talking to a number of filmmakers coming this i guess this is when your real test and your real life fears come to be realized right because of course this is your premiere this is going to be the first time where you're sitting in a dark room are you sitting at the front or the back so you're going to feel the eyes behind them or are you going to be looking down at people <laughs> from the back of the screening when you see people actually... react it for the first time I don't actually know. Uh, James bought my ticket. I just know I'm following him around. I think I'll probably be a shaking pile of mess at this point. So I like he. I don't even think I have. He's he's telling me where to go sit for my nerves. But and you know I, I yeah. This is where the rubber hits the road, right? You know what I mean? When you you sit in a room and you create something and you work on it and you read it and you ask colleagues to read it and you put so much pressure on it and you work on it and making an independent film if you've ever done it is is just one of the most challenging things I think that exists in the world. It is so hard constantly and there's so many obstacles you have to overcome, not only in like the physical sense of doing it, but in the financial sense of actually getting things together to make it. Um, just everything always seems to be constantly against you. So I think we're taking the approach of like, look, we made it. I'm very proud of it. I think that we made something that I will totally can absolutely stand by that I believe in what it says. I believe in how we made it. I think we did the best possible job with and we left no stone unturned. There's always things you wish you could do a little more. You wish you'd gotten a little more of this action sequence or we could have expanded this. There were scenes we had to trim initially to get in there, but we tried to rewrite it and compromise and flex things to make up for it. And you know, it, it is what it is to a degree where we are, if we were sitting here and I wasn't really happy with the film, I'd feel a lot differently. I feel good about it. That's the best you can do. You know, we did the best we can. We tried to tell a story that we thought would be meaningful and entertaining. Um, and now we see what the audience thinks. And then you take those notes forward with you. You learn from what happened here and you go and you make the next one. So when you're sitting there in that room, um, what would be your your dream scenario? What what do you want to hear people saying, and what do you want to see those reactions as they you know the lights come back up and they step out? What would be what would be the what would make your trip to hear people mm. saying and reacting as they step out? You know, it's uh, I want people to find the film entertaining. Like I hope that they engage in it and want to watch it. Um, and, you know, I'll be holding my breath through a certain scene in the, you know, the first act of the films. I truly believe if you make it through this section, if you make it to this scene, you're in. Uh, and if you don't make it to here, it's probably not your movie. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping people are entertained. And I think the film really is about the choices and decisions people make. And I think we tried to walk a razor thin sort of line where we are not trying. We didn't come in with a trying to vindicate one or really press one viewpoint on the film. We tried to bring sort of personal examinations from people we know, people in our lives, 
you know, the way we live our lives and people we encounter. So we're trying for me, it'd be if people have an opinion, if you it doesn't really matter which side you fall on. To me, it just is like that it made you kind of think about the decisions that were made and what you would have done differently. That to me is sort of the win because it's not just an entertainment piece where you're supposed to fall through the story. If you get to the end and you're like, well, I thought this was, you know, I don't know why she did that or he did that or I wouldn't have done that or that was so dumb. Like that to me is sort of about what it's about. It's about how you would make decisions on you think under these sort of high pressure situations. Yeah, I think that was a, for me, a, a nice triumph of the film that I feel like in the particularly polarized world that we live in at the moment as well, where, you know, culture wars are a fairly standard thing. I think you could watch this, several audiences could watch this and you're going to come away with different characters that you identify with. I think you could be sitting in the cinema screen, particularly one that fills up very quickly and you're not necessarily sitting next to people you know. One of you could walk out and be like, this is my guy of the film or I would have been like this guy, I would have joined this faction or I would have thought this, like you say, or you could quite happily be sitting next to someone you've had a perfectly lovely time with at the cinema you've met at this event who could identify with a completely different set of characters. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. yeah, it's, I think for me, one of the interesting parts of the film was that kind of dynamic and the space it's got to um, grow as well. I think one of my bugbears I sometimes have with the, with the film is when there is no room for imagination or change. And it's like, no, this is the answer. This is how it was. The next 20 years of their lives mapped out like this, and this is what happened having this where it's like oh what did this person do or how would they have reacted or how were they you know not just in the aftermath but what took place to get them where they were today as well um nice character yeah. work that you can jump in as that snapshot and you can be brought on board with where they are i appreciate that andy and that really honestly every time i hear that which i've not heard it very often because we haven't shown the film very much is like it makes me feel very good because that was sort of the mission you know so <laughs> thanks for like first of all watching it and second of all i appreciate that you took that away from it um you know i think the film itself is you know heard is about two women going on a camping trip they're trying to save their failing marriage and they end up trapped between warring militia groups and a zombie outbreak and really it comes down to the lead character jamie she has to fight for love and survival basically and she's gone through you know obviously it starts she starts in a negative place and the story is about her sort of falling back in love through all these different things and learning to face her demons her own demons which she's trying to run away from so you know it that's sort of the main plot of it but there are four or five other characters that have really in my opinion very deep and interesting sort of pathways to how they got into these worlds and we end up with a couple different militia groups and they especially the main one we focus on is john gruber's and they it's a very deep uh, to me, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in there, and I think it echoes characters in real life that I've seen, and you know, they're, they're, then how they interact with each other in their own inner inner sort of fight. So yeah, that 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 was you know really what we were trying to talk about. Oh, fantastic. So we talked about a lot behind the camera, getting it already. Tell me a little bit about your that your cast in front of the camera. The actors that you're familiar with you've worked with before as it was a totally fresh cast for you what attracted you to the people you chose it's again a little bit of a mix um you know i'll start we we ended up with getting incredible uh, the woman who plays the lead ellen adair they auditioned and uh they were a, a part of a whole large casting call that we did and you, they were just incredible from the beginning. Like, you know, um, it, it's something you don't expect um, to see somebody just completely nail it, but they are incredible in the film. And I truly think they were they really, really elevated it. And then we also have Mitzi Akaha to star beside her and Mitzi sort of the opposite style of actor, but it works completely for the, the character. I mean, both of them sort of just embody the lead characters. How, now, people I'd worked before with, we have a great cast in like, Jeremy Holm, he plays a character called Big John Gruber. He's sort of the head of one of the militias, former military guy, um, and he's just trying to figure out how to lead. He's a guy that's always wanted to lead and is trying to figure out how. Jeremy, I've known forever. Um, he got me my first job in New York City in the kitchen at a, at a steakhouse when I got out of college because I just assistant directed him in a play at a regional theater. And he he's helped me move to the city. I've been friends with him forever. And he sort of always plays... 
lot in the ranger um you know and he's like the film the ranger he always plays this tough guy because of how he looks but the thing if you know jeremy you know that he does have this he was an mma fighter he is a very big tough guy but he's also one of the most like emotionally supportive and available people that you'd ever meet so when we wrote this character it was sort of an opportunity for him to you know, it was written specifically for him, somebody that looks, and that's when he's introduced in the film, you're meant to see him as the bad guy. And I think you sort of do, I, I hope. That's sort of my hope, is that you're like, ah, that's the guy to not trust. And then there's some pri- surprises that come with that. Not, It's not exclusive. Again, he's a fully, he's a complicated person, but there, he, he may surprise you as the film goes on. So, um, yeah, he's he's great. And then same with like uh, we've got Dana Snyder, who's Master Shake from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. That seems to be like as the trailer has come out, people have really responded to Dana being in the films. I think people are used to hearing his voice and not seeing his face. But he and I went to the same school. I've known him for a while and he's a very funny guy. Um, so it was we kind of wrote, you know, a character for him where he plays a doctor and it's sort of right at the top of act two and everything's really tense and really tight and everything's super like almost verging on being over dramatic at that point. And then you cut in this kind of guy that's frankly just like a, he's not doing comedic beats, but just even when he talks, like if you hear master shake, like yeah. talking and like acting real, I think it sort of cuts through the, 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 the syrupy, you know, molasses that could be the drama. And it just kind of makes you take a step back. Cause it's not what you expect um and it, he was super fun too and then like amanda fuller's like a friend of ours we've known forever and god she's been in everything um and she came on like last minute to play a very small role that we just couldn't cast like it was there's this character diane that has a really strong uh, second act presence late second act early third act presence and she uh we couldn't cast it we were trying to find somebody that could kind of play this like very introverted sort of you know waspish character it, plays the opposite like she's like uh, you know she's the last man standing and orange is the new black she plays like the villain the toughest person and that's what she is in person in life and we we're just uh we knew her and it was like hey do you want to try this because you're a great actor and you know we, we like hanging out with you you know we're friends she's really close with one of our producers and she's like hell yeah what is she she wanted to come try it and honestly i think she does a great job she she goes it's hard to play characters that are not so forefront you know like that aren't like chewing the scenery many times that's harder to act and i think she does a great job very true and i love the diversity of the cast that you had it looks like they are just a group of people that happen to live in the same place that were thrown together and have gone through this incident that obviously our characters were following didn't see until they are thrown into that later on because of the nature of the trip that they're on in the wilderness right which is nice to have yeah. to you don't have to necessarily have those origin beats where yes i know how this all began and all these things it's nice to be able to get into this as it's already happened to do some of the interesting pieces which you know when you're doing a like you know a 90 100 minute film sometimes there's a necessity right how much of your time would you lose if you did right this was where this all began and all of the all the details like it's nice to see these things developing really really interesting yeah and that's a challenge That's a challenge in any film, you know, feature films you feel like are so long, you know, whenever you're writing shorts, you're like, oh, God, or commercials, like when I get a chance to write a feature, it's going to, you can finally have the chance to stretch your wings and get all the awesome story points in you want. And it's just the opposite, actually. I mean, you have to be so cognizant of how fast it moves. Um, And we do a lot of like the, the origin story for Jamie, she starts off in sort of a negative place, really hard place for a character to start, Um, you know, and I think that that has been that's always been a challenge of the screenplay that we've known in the film and we worked on it quite a lot trying to make it move as quickly as possible while giving you valuable reasons to care for the lead character, hopefully. Um, and we also were very blessed that we got Corbin Burnson on to play the father of Jamie, um, who's kind of her origin story is an abusive alcoholic father. And you only see him in the beginning of the film and then through a few flashbacks. But he's doing a lot of storytelling when you see him in a very short bit. And that's also intentional because it's supposed to be when she's thinking about it, she's physically being drawn back to where she's trying to get away from. She started in this area. She ran away from it because of her father kicked her out. Um, you get all this through the opening sections of the film, so I'm not really giving you too much away here. It's like, but then when we have the flashbacks, it acts as her memory. It's these things that these traumas that she doesn't deal with that keep coming up when they're these little trigger moments or these moments that she's just, you know, she's trying to run away from all of this. And Corbin is so effective 
He's such a good actor uh, in the opening sequence, the very opening of the film. It starts with the first zombie encounter and you see him basically running away from a zombie and trying to trying to is this whole event is starting. And we were I remember we were filming this sequence around a truck, which I think is super fun. It's very fun intention. He's kind of like hiding in the zombies on the other side and we're moving around and he, I remember we were getting towards the back of the truck at one point and he's like, you know, here, you know, we need, I need something here to interact with. There needs to be some kind of moment to break up this sequence. Cause I just had him coming around the end of the truck and then going on and, and, and then the scene continues. And he's like, here needs to be a moment. And I said, oh, okay, well, what if we just put some wrenches or something here by the tire? Like you'd been working on this truck and you know, it was up it was up on a lift. Um, and he's like, that's perfect. And then he like stumbled on it, but he was just such a gracious and it works. It, I mean, if you don't, I've thought constantly, if we didn't have that moment in there, um, you know, it'd be too, too sterile. Cause when you write it and you're shooting it, you haven't edited it yet. And it feels so fast in your head. And that sequence desperately needed something there to break it up that I hadn't identified. And Corbin was just so gracious and being like, Hey, here's an idea I have. And it really worked. And he could do anything like that with any of these flashbacks. He'd do just something small and subtle. And you're like, that's why you were such a great, <laughs> great and actor makes, and such and a great success. Makes these things feel, makes the sets feel lived in and like real places, not like stages 100%. to do a play, right? You're having these like, oh, again, like the characters. It's like, there were things happening before you were watching here. You know, there are tools out there. are Yeah, so yeah, all, all adds to the effect. Um, I understand that the team are coming live and in person in force to Fright Fest as well. How many of the cast and crew have you got coming over in total? So we've got a significant portion of the cast and uh, most of the filmmaking team, the producers and me will be there. Um, and, you know, actually, it's very exciting if you are coming. I don't know when this comes out, um, but we are having actually an opportunity to do a little meet and greet right before the screening in Leicester Square. There's a we're going to be meeting up at the, uh, the I think it's the Baron Arms or something. It's like the, it's right across the square from the theater. So for I think from four to five thirty, we're doing a little meet and greet with the cast where they're agreed to you know, like kind of come and. Anybody that's interested in, you know, seeing them before the thing, we're going to do just a very light sort of hangout um, and then go go screen this bad boy. So, I mean, obviously, Andy, you're invited. Love to meet you in person. Amazing. Well, we'll guys. we will see you there. I'm traveling south at time of recording. It is uh, currently Tuesday. I'm traveling down south uh, tomorrow. I will be in London from Thursday myself as well. Um, ben is a super quick editor. He will have this, I believe, dropping <laughs> on the feed. I believe this is going to be out tomorrow. So if you're oh my gosh. today it yeah. comes out, then there is time. Get yourselves get yourselves over. Come and catch Stephen and a very uh, jet lagged cast and crew to um, say hey. Although the rest of them have travelled earlier than you, right? So they've had they'll have a day or so to recover. It's just you. Red Everybody eye else again. is getting the opportunity to go see a bunch of the other films and things. I've just had a I've just have an infant at home. We just had a new baby, so I'm uh, I, I have a, I have worldly responsibilities that I've carved away just enough time to come to London to to get the experience of Herd and a couple of other pieces, and then I got to come back. Yeah, you don't have to end up going on a traumatic canoe trip to try and repair your marriage for abandoning your family to <laughs> exactly. go to the Premier, right? Although I'm not going on a camping trip. If that, I can say for sure, if that does happen, we are not going camping. Just get <laughs> a therapy, be more traditional. <laughs> <laughs> right, Stephen, just before we wrap up, I've got a couple of very, very important questions for you. Oh boy. The, the first okay. one is, of course, very, very important. Second most important question I'm going to ask Okay. Where do anyone, where's anyone listening to this? Where do they follow you or your production company if they want updates on Herd or anything else you're working on? Where is the best place to find you? Social media is not what it used to be. So where's the best place to catch up with you? You know, the best place to follow me and the film is on Instagram. Uh, you can check us out at mine is at Stephen with a V, the letter C as in cat and then Pierce. So at Stephen C Pierce on Instagram. And herd is super easy it's at herd.film. That's also our website, herd.film. So that's where we've got a bunch of exciting premieres coming up and events in the US um, shortly after this and surrounding the release. Uh, it, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for people to go see it theatrically as well. That'll be, you know, in the UK, the US, and other territories around the world. And all that will be updated and carried on uh, herd.film, the website. That will, that'll have the most updated to, to date information uh, through the fall where you can find the film. Amazing. Thank you so much. And now the biggie. This is the real pressure question for you, Stephen. So 
you're a horror filmmaker, you're a horror film fan. I imagine you're interacting with people who like horror movies. So set the scene, if you will. You're having your very own horror hangout here. You're having some people around. They're going to be, you want to get ready. It's a spooky season. You're going to watch a horror movie. Eyes turn to you. What movie are you putting on? What is your horror movie of choice? Mm, yeah, to entertain so this a group is, of friends to hang out with it, and enjoy what you what you 100 percent. so you know i'm always going to trend towards the i love the really psychological and kind of like character driven stuff of like the shining or you know honestly the babadook probably be the one i'd say let's put that on i think it's scary and does so much um with the character work in it um you know, and but I'm also like a, you know, I, I don't know, it's it's a wide genre, it's not as much horror, but I'd also, you know, depending on the group, I have done this with friends before, we're just like in the middle of the afternoon, we'll just like turn on something like a clockwork orange and like, you know, watch a, watch a real, <laughs> watch something yeah. really intense, psychologically really intense. disturbing. Yeah. Oh, this if you're trying to get in the mood for herd, if I was like trying to do a pre prequel on that, I'd throw like, you know, season one of the walking dead or 28 days later. Or The Last of Us, although they, you know, that like that's it's I think they just did a fantastic job that whole yeah. series. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Looking forward to the second one. If we can just get all of the uh all the studios to play ball with the strikes, then we can be then we can actually start getting this new content coming out again in a in an ethical way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we're also, you know, we're one of the films that one of the few films that do have an interim agreement with the union at the moment because we wanted to and we do believe in obviously the workers rights across the board um and we were able to you know get and secure an agreement with sag and look at the new terms and they don't seem to be super insane to me so hopefully this will all be blown over very quickly but luckily for us we do have the opportunity for the cast to come because uh, not all films can do that at the moment, which is a real, it's a bummer for the people that make the films, especially independent films, both on the creative and the acting side, but we don't have that problem at the moment. So we're, we're very fortunate to get to enjoy Fright Fest at its fullest. Good to hear it. Well, Stephen, I will leave you there to get on with um, spending time with that uh, that family of yours before you have to um, get on the road. <laughs> really <laughs> lovely to um, chat to you. For everyone else listening, um, there's a lot on your feed right now. You'll be sick of the sound of Ben and I. Um, lots of interviews we're going to be doing, obviously, all of our Fright Fest content, which will be out after the event. If you're there live, come and say hi to Stephen, to the cast, the crew, to us, whoever you see around there over London this weekend. For those of you not fortunate enough to be close to London, then lots of content still available for you to enjoy and lots of things for you to look out for and add to those letterboxed watch lists ready for when all of these things become available wherever you are um thank you for listening everybody and we will see you live at fright fest very soon thank you so much Stephen. thank you andy